Welcome to Microdose Psychedelic Insights, powered by The Conscious Fund. This is the Psychedelic Insider Series, fireside chats with industry leaders in the psychedelic space. Yes. So <clears throat> I guess I'll introduce this. Uh, hello, everyone who is joining us right now. Uh, my name is Elena Armstrong. I'm here on behalf of Alan Aldis, and I welcome you all to yet another Microdose uh, Psychedelic Insiders um, session. And today we have David Wood of BLG Law. Hi, really happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, David. So much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Uh, great. How are you doing? I'm excellent. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a busy Monday. It's nice that uh, people are uh, joining in. Um, and I think we'll just get started right away. I love your shirt. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, uh, uh, me too. It's very stylish. Oh, we're kind of, uh, we've got, we've got a thing going with the art behind me and your shirt. So um, we'll just uh, get it start off naturally. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, your company and what you do and specifically what you do in the cannabis and as well as psychedelic sector. Yeah, thank you. Happy to. So I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer and a patent agent. Uh, and I'm also a partner at Borden Ladner Gervais LLP. That's the largest national law firm in Canada. Um, there's four Canadian firms with a head count of over 700 professionals and we're one of them. And uh, I've been here for about 10 years. I was called to the bar in 2009. And uh, from 2009 till 2016, my practice was exclusively patent law. Um, and what that meant for me day to day is I was advising uh, companies who were looking to protect inventions with patent applications. And I was also supporting uh, particip well, defendants and plaintiffs in patent litigation, uh, working alongside our litigation group, um, helping defend claims uh, and enforce them, mostly in oil and gas, um, but also in autonomous vehicles. Uh, in 2016, I went to a clinic in Calgary that was uh, quite liberal in its uh, medical document writing policies. And uh, I got medical access into cannabis in mid 2016 and uh, uh, got signed up with Aurora because one day delivery in Calgary, um, great, great value there. And, and then I learned that uh, Canada's medical cannabis system was multi-participant and uh, completely commercial. Uh, so that was interesting to me as a lawyer because I figured they must have lawyers. So I immediately put all of my business development efforts into cannabis. Um, went to my first cannabis trade show in uh, 2016 in June in Oakland, uh, the NCIA uh, Business Expo, and uh, very informative. Um, and then went to Lyft in Vancouver shortly after that in September 2016. And then very quickly after that, cannabis became a significant and growing part of my practice. Uh, our firm advised uh, Canimed Therapeutics on its uh, IPO, which was the first actual IPO in the industry in Canada or anywhere, I think. Um, not sure when one happened in the States. And uh, from there, it just became a bigger and bigger part of my practice until it became essentially all of my practice and and began spilling over into other people as well and now um about 95 percent of my work is either in psychedelics or cannabis um and it's it's wonderful i feel very uh privileged and fortunate to be working in this area it's it's great to work uh with something you believe in and something that is going to uh uh something that's certainly going to help people and and also something where i see a lot of commercial potential so it's you know just kind of great on every point to be to be servicing both of these industries uh that that would be the cannabis industry and also i wouldn't really call it an industry but let's say the psychedelic space is uh it's so diverse i mean there's so many different things people are doing and it's not based around you know a commodity based consumer packaged goods product mm -hmm. so uh, and then to answer your question blg works with clients in all kinds of areas. And uh, my, while my practice is focused completely on cannabis and psychedelics, uh, I 
it's it's been very rewarding to be able to work in very effective teams with other members of the firm in all five offices actually um where where while i may understand the context in the industry it's it's very rewarding to build client teams where i have practitioners from other practice groups also helping those clients it's uh it's great to be on a, a national platform like that. Right. Uh, so you're foray into the into uh, the cannabis industry and the psychedelic space. It, it uh, doesn't seem too much different than my own. It just really creeped in. So it's is it fair to say that you didn't really picture yourself dealing in uh, the cannabis world? Uh, you know, let's say when you were about to finish high school or about to graduate from uni. No, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm 41, so, uh, 42, just turned 42. So the just say no campaign really got me. In fact, if you would have told me in high school that uh, uh, I was going to be, you know, <laughs> advising companies with respect to cannabis and psychedelics, uh, I probably would have phoned the police. Uh, <laughs> but a, a, a few years later, uh, actually right at the end of high school, I, I met my first person who used cannabis, but was not, uh, you know, exactly what you saw in the commercials that I grew up with. Um, for whatever reason, most of the people I met initially who did use cannabis were, you know, kind of not role models, let's say, put it that way. But it, it was kind of in, at the start of university, when I met people that were more thoughtful, who did use it, that I realized, you know, that we'd been sold a, a, a false, false narrative on, on cannabis and other drugs. But uh, no, certainly wouldn't have thought that, but more than happy to be doing it. And again, for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit what, it, uh, tell me a little bit about what it's like to, you know, um, on one hand, you know, sort of infiltrate that market, but also, um, you know, normalize it within a company that's as big as BLG. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it, it was quite rewarding. Um, I, I've always, I've never supported prohibition of cannabis. And uh, as soon as I was legally authorized to possess it in mid 2016 and to use it anywhere where municipal smoking bylaws allowed its use, uh, just like cigarettes, um, it's different now, of course, uh, um, in the municipality of Calgary, use of cannabis in public is prohibited unless one has medical access, unlike tobacco. But at the time in 2016, basically, if you could smoke cigarettes in a location, you could smoke cannabis in a location. So I did uh, help myself to some medical cannabis at several firm events. And that was uh, greeted with some confusion initially. But, uh, you know, as you hinted at, it's there's no reason, particularly an event where where beverage alcohol is being served. It's it's just plain inconsistent to to say that's okay, but cannabis isn't, you know, especially now. And I mean, people are grappling with that and it's, it's open to employers to have their own policies on anything. But, but from my view, it's, it's forward thinking to uh, subject to smoking and vaping laws just to allow cannabis if the context makes it appropriate. And just like beverage alcohol, I think people need to decide for themselves what's appropriate in a given social situation. And, the natural social consequences of how we behave uh, will will play themselves out, you know, regardless of whether or not substances are being used, where those substances are legal. Um, but yeah, in, in general, it, it was rewarding to to just have open discussions with people about it. And it was funny when, uh, and this happened enough times that I'm definitely not identifying anyone here, when uh, lawyers, in some cases significantly senior to me, would come to my office, close the door, and ask which LP to buy from when they had medical access, back when we still called them LPs. So that, that was interesting itself. And I mean, it's it's great for anyone working in this industry to engage with people who don't know much about it. And for me, that was uh, Uber drivers frequently, foreign ones who I could kind of guess probably didn't give it a second thought, but if they did put their mind to it, would think very little of it. And it's interesting to remind those people that while the move from prohibition to regulation means that 
people are free to use it. No one is saying they have to. No one is saying their children have to. It's simply a choice that's being made available to adults. And it's going to be fiscally conservative compared with prohibition, which is expensive. It's a very expensive policy. Um, so it, it's very rewarding to, to do that. And in my personal life, just with, you know, my circle of friends and my family and, uh, you know, they got to see what we're seeing develop as, let's say, I don't want to use the word normal, but let's say mundane. Uh, because if you say cannabis is normal, that kind of sounds like you're saying everyone should do it. And I think everyone should make their own choice. Uh, so mundane is, is a word I like, but it's, it, it is good to, to talk to people who resist the idea and help them understand that even if they had a relative who, who had made bad choices and ended up in a bad place and drugs were involved, often when you ask yourself whether prohibition helped their loved one, uh, the answer is clearly no, it didn't. And, uh, and I'm not sure how regulation exacerbates what those people go through. I don't think it matters. But actually, can we talk a little bit about the economics of prohibition? Since Absolutely, you I'd that? love to. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you mentioned that it's a, a you know, a costly um, uh, 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 model to have in place, I suppose. Um, let's talk about that. What, what is involved in, in the costs of prohibiting something like cannabis or, or even bigger cannabis and psychedelics? Yeah, sure. No, and I, and I don't, I'll, I'll preface this with, I'm not an expert on this point and I don't know the numbers. So I'm sure if people look stuff up, they can, you know, assign a magnitude to what I'm saying, but just as a general principle, I mean, if a substance is prohibited instead of not being prohibited then there's going to be administrative costs with enforcing that prohibition and if people have criminal records uh, because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time and they were in possession of something then they're not gonna their career options may become limited now you've taken someone out of a higher tax paying bracket you know and again i appreciate that the law is the law and there's a lot of people who'd say, well, you know, I have no sympathy for that. This person possessed the substance. So the law said they shouldn't. There's consequences. You know, of course, that makes sense. Except when it becomes arguably more costly to prohibit than it does to regulate. And that's where, again, if you, if you think about the costs of the law enforcement's time, uh, and then the impact on the the individual involved. Um, and then also the fact that there's a lucrative market for cannabis and for other drugs. And, and I mean, one of the primary reasons we regulated cannabis, uh, other than protecting children, I think kind of the second reason is to diminish the opportunity for criminals and the, the, uh, the benefits that they're realizing from essentially a monopoly on on trade and illicit drugs. So I think there's economic consequences that way as well. And then stack on top of it that the regulated industry, um, it employs people. And I know there's been a lot of layoffs recently and, you know, a, a reckoning that many predicted would happen has happened and there's nothing that surprising about that. But I also note that the trend for sales at retail is increasing all the time. Uh, I, I've personally seen prices go down in Calgary. I've seen eights of reasonable quality cannabis for $25. That's real competition in my view for the illicit market. And uh, as if you, if you consider that it's okay for people to make this choice to buy cannabis and by extension, other drugs, uh, then it's better to let people have jobs producing products that can be purchased and pay taxes and be employed and not be unemployed. You know, all of those are economic pluses too. Um, UN conventions say we can't do this. Um, the conventions are clear in what they say. But I think when you look at the purposes of those conventions, which are to reduce social and economic harms, the result from drug abuse it doesn't say use it says drug abuse I, I think we can do a better job with regulation 
Um, so I, I think I answered a couple of questions at once there, but it's the economic costs are, are, are multifaceted. And, uh, and I, I haven't seen a breakdown with numbers, but to me, just rationally, if you can avoid putting people in jail, and if you can avoid empowering organized crime, and if you can employ people while you're doing it, it just has to make sense. Well, and, and then also the products. When people purchase the products, they're paying tax, they're paying excise duty. So besides all the employment, you know, the government's getting revenue directly that way. And it's just all coming from a market that was there before, but was completely illicit. Yeah, it was totally off the books, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, in terms of communicating these things, what are the best ways that, you know, the uh, the average consumer, the advocate, the voter, the maybe the person that wants to get into the uh, cannabis space. We'll, we'll talk about the cannabis space specifically in this question, um, and then we'll get on to psychedelics. But what can we all do to kind of impart these values on, on the government that actually regulates all of these products and the way that they're bought and sold? Well, I mean, I'm no expert on government engagement. I'm used to engaging with the regulator with Health Canada or in Alberta with AGLC. Um, that's Alberta Gaming, Liquor and Cannabis. It used to be the Alberta Gaming and Liquor Commission. I am very, I have a lot of admiration that they did not have to rebrand or change their URL. They simply changed what the last C meant. That was brilliant. Uh, but they, those that regulators do not make the law. So, you know, people, I think you're asking about people who are interested in helping change how things are done. I mean, the regulator, if you're persistent, I think can be easy to get through to. Um, but it might, I'm sorry, the, the question was how people can affect change. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think, I mean, just, uh, the way I, I suppose at the legislative level through lobbying, like with anything, and I'm, I'm, there are many groups actively lobbying. I'm sure uh, packaging is, is a big issue that the industry points to as limiting it. I, I understand the argument. Um, I, I'm packaging not, and marketing, I think, uh, are, yeah. are kind of, yeah, for sure. No, and it, it is certainly... Uh, you know, as someone who's very conscious of these regulations, when I drive home from kind of anywhere, when I'm driving back to my, the part of the suburb I live in, I always, I see a giant billboard that advertises liquor specials complete with price, which, you know, Cannabis Act is very clear that advertisements of price are prohibited. Um, so, you know, I obviously, it's concerning to me that my, my children, my, you know, pre-teenage children can look at that sign and, and see very enticing bottles of, of liquor, of beverage alcohol that are brightly colored and look great. And, you know, some of them have fun things like pirates on them, but, uh, and, and they can learn what they cost and they can be non-threatening. And then they see a stop sign when they see a cannabis product, you know, so I'm not sure what message that is sending children. I mean, and, and I think it is one that suggests that maybe more liberalized packaging for cannabis would make sense. But we also have to appreciate that we just regulated a controlled substance. That's, uh, you know, that's a first in a country of Canada's size and international position. So, you know, I'm not that surprised or really disappointed. And I've seen some great, you know, people can do good things with color and with placement to the extent they're allowed to move things around a bit on the box. I've seen them get creative. And, uh, you know, I, th I, th I think, I think it's just a set of rules they have to play in. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how enormous that impact was on the packaging, more on the marketing. I can see why, why they'd want to be able to communicate about the products more effectively. That, that I understand more, more so than packaging. Um, I think we got a little off topic, though. No, no. I, actually, your last question just it gave me a, 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 another 
sorry, your last um, uh, answer gave me just one more question before we move on to psychedelics. Um, so what, what was your reaction when you saw that during COVID uh, that cannabis was, was made an essential uh, service or essential product in, in, in the same way as alcohol? Yeah, no, I mean, I was impressed. And I mean, once we're, what, 15 months into regulated markets, more, I guess more, um, more like uh, 17 months, it, we're kind of all there that it's a thing people do. And I mean, obviously you want to, I, I, I did not fact check this, but I heard that uh, domestic violence and other things that might come with cabin fever were, uh, were increased during COVID. So I personally think that cannabis would be, you know, at least with people I've met, more of a good thing than a bad thing, you know, at least if it's not being mixed with, uh, with alcohol in, in that kind of situation. And I was happy that, you know, to the extent people can afford it, uh, if they're going to be either on reduced hours or out of work and, and stuck in their house, it might not be a terrible thing to, to have that as an option. I mean, it, it didn't surprise me at all that, that sales climbed a bit uh, initially. Um, that might have been a combination of people just wanting to have it handy, but also maybe being worried about the supply chain. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's easy for me or you to, to really stay on top of things and understand what's happening. And, but I think for the person who has an average level of understanding of cannabis, uh, who knows, like they, they might've, there might've, it's, it's quite rational that a lot of people would have been concerned that it wouldn't be available to buy very soon. Right. Hey, so, if there's a run on toilet paper, why wouldn't there be a run on <laughs> cannabis? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I've uh, heard similar comments. Yes. Um, so it, didn't, it didn't surprise me. Um, in, in fact, knowing that Alberta was uh, going to put an extra tax on concentrate cartridges, I might've done a little stockpiling myself. Oh, really? Eh? Um, I, okay, so I promise we're going to get into psychedelics. I want to know now, like, um, you know, uh, during a lot of these conversations, we are talking to people who uh, started off in cannabis, or, you know, they have a, a professional designation, they forayed into cannabis, and now psychedelics. So tell me a little bit about how you got here. Yeah, no, I'd love to. So again, when I I, I'd been a, a patent lawyer and patent agent for about seven years when uh, when cannabis came across as, as something I could go for in business development. And, and I, I should have mentioned earlier, it was during that very first conference that I realized that while, while intellectual property is relevant to 100% of these companies, and some of them are going to put energy into it, regulatory law is also relevant to 100% of them, and all of them are essentially forced to be conscious of that. I mean, with intellectual property, it's, it's not a good way to run a business, but one can be cavalier about it and uh, not notice the consequences for years. But if you're a license holder, especially in 2016 or 17, when those licenses were more valuable than they are today, you, you know, regulatory compliance and ensuring that all commercial agreements are compliant with regulations was, was critical. So I, kind of developed a regulatory practice between about late 2016 and mid 2017. And now it's in addition to intellectual property, it's, it's kind of the main thing I, I advise directly on. And that was a very good background. Both of those were a very good background for psychedelics. Um, and, and like other people you're interviewing, I had clients who were in cannabis, they were making money in cannabis and it was going well but they were very interested in psychedelics uh, and in the potential to commercialize them and in the potential to see liberalized access to psychedelics. So, and, and personally, I actually came into the cannabis industry in 2016, knowing essentially zero about cannabis. I'd always uh, been in favor of it being accessible to people, but I, I didn't, understand and, and bear in mind i lived in saskatchewan and then in alberta and i was never really that close to people who grew it themselves so to me cannabis was pretty homogenous like i didn't appreciate how different different varieties can be um i, I didn't see a vape pen or a professionally made edible till i went to oakland in 2016 so i, I went into it really not knowing very very little uh about about the science um i 
I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I have a PhD in biochemistry and, and that did include some formal education in plant metabolism, uh, organic chemistry and natural health products, uh, sorry, uh, secondary products, which a lot of natural health products are. Uh, secondary metabolic products are products plants make, plants, fungi, and other organisms that don't seem to have a clear role in the plant itself and relate more to its interaction with the environment. And uh, we look at phytocannabinoids and terpenoids in cannabis as chemicals of this nature. They're there more to deal with the external environment than they are to help the plant live, at least on my understanding. And if anyone... Okay knows otherwise i'm happy to to be corrected but uh that so just talking about phytocannabinoids so these are the cannabinoids that the plant might produce to protect against uv rays or other stressors in the environment just it, to, insects i think uh insects, some, some to do with fungus. how they deal with insects yeah yeah Got it. and and again my my scientific background kind of starts after cultivation i i don't have any formal training in botany but I do, I understand more of the chemistry of what's in the plant and how to put it into an extract. And, and then I understand the genetics of the plant. Like I know how genes work, but I don't, but the actual botany and horticulture part, I'm, I'm very thin on personally. Uh, luckily, I'm in touch with some true experts in that area. And it's always a privilege to listen to them talk. Uh, but they, it, with my background, I was actually a lot more interested on a personal level in reading about psychedelics uh, than I was cannabis. I, I'm coming, I came in, I, I mean, even coming into law as a lawyer in 2009, I, I knew a lot about psychedelics and, and what had been done in the past and uh, what the different categories of chemicals were. But in 2009, it was not something that I brought up a lot with my colleagues for obvious reasons. So coming into psychedelics for me actually is a better fit uh, than, than cannabis is because I know the background and the history of them. Uh, and by that, I mean more ancient history, but also of course, recent history uh, much, much better than, than I understood cannabis. I mean, I came a long way in four years by uh, basically just working, and not doing a lot else in cannabis. Uh, so I mean, I've definitely equalized my knowledge a bit, but uh, it's exciting to come into something where my background, uh, where I do know a lot more relevant stuff and, and relevant people and, and the applications that psychedelics might have as drug products and, and maybe even outside of strictly drug products. Mm. Do you mind telling us a little bit more about your personal connection to psychedelics? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I've, I've always, uh, well, well, besides the fact that I really like Pink Floyd, so I, I think without psychedelics, <laughs> they don't exist. So there, there's, that, that's enough reason right there. But I, uh, um, I, I know a lot of people who benefited tremendously from them. And I've, I've seen very little of what I guess you'd call the negative side of them. I mean, I've seen people have a hard time at, at social events, probably because they made a reckless decision. But for the most part, I mean, the people I know who, who've experimented with them and who uh, integrate them into their lives, they, they do, they're fine. You know, they're functional, responsible people. And, uh, and the ones that aren't, I, I certainly do not blame the drugs. Like it's, uh, so I, I've just, I've always found it confusing that that's an experience we're simply not allowed to access. And when it, when it seems so valuable and, and I mean, you look at the Steve jobs quote, right? I don't, I don't want to butcher his quote, but it, it something along the lines of LSD was one of the most important experiences of his life. So if a man as accomplished as him is saying that, like if a person who's built Apple is saying LSD was important, I mean, this isn't a guy that peaked in high school, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's, it's very telling that you see these kind of thoughtful expressions of the benefits of these chemicals. And, and, and I think just personally, the, the role I see for them in personal development, and I mean, I could go on, there's so many highly public figures, you know, Tim Ferriss uh, would be a gra another great example, probably programmers whose names I don't recognize, They're very accomplished people in Silicon Valley. Like there's, there's a number of people who are 
really pushing the benefits of these compounds um, who are very credible people. And, mm-hmm. and then you look at the studies being done, you know, with, uh, with PTSD and addiction and, and other, let's say, trauma associated problems, PTSD, of course, with MDMA. Uh, to me, I just wonder, what if we step outside a therapeutic response to a condition and let people access these, much like they are in Jamaica, because they think it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. And, and I, again, personally, I've just always been very much of the opinion that that's not unachievable. That's, that's something we can probably do and responsibly regulate. And I look to, you know, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I, I independently arrived at this, but I heard Mark Hayden use exactly the same analogy uh, a, a pilot's license, right? We let people fly planes. That's incredibly dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and, uh, but we let people do it and they can, and there's rules and they have to get tested and they have to be ready to fly a plane and ready to fly a plane by themselves. And I don't know why we couldn't do a similar thing with psychedelics. And then if you remind me that, Claims are not controlled substances. Well, this country has regulated one of those as well. And maybe if, as time goes by, Canada remains and is of the opinion generally as a country that that regulating cannabis was a good move, not a bad move. You know, I I think there's a real argument to be made that there's other chemicals that that don't kill people that uh, many say make their lives better. Uh, and that many say have healed them, you know, there's other chemicals that maybe shouldn't be completely prohibited. And I'm not sure the answer is to say, Hey, you know, go to a store, you can buy a sheet of acid there and walk out with it. I I don't know if that's the right way to do it. Um, but it seems to me like some sort of, you know, controlled access and maybe that, qualifies you before you're considered responsible enough to possess outside of that environment, maybe that's a good idea. And then when you complicate the whole analysis by pointing out that a very effective, very user-friendly, uh, you know, well-known example of a psychedelic, psilocybin mushrooms, is, is very easy to cultivate personally, uh, I, I don't know where the whole analysis goes from there. Because, uh, you know, I'm in favor of appropriate levels of regulation. And certainly, you don't want to just have a no rules situation. I mean, I don't think that would be the way to go as a parent as you know, just a citizen. But th- there has to be a way that adults can access it without breaking the law, but without a doctor telling them they need to and certainly without the Minister mm-hmm. of Health personally approving a special application. Like it just, it it seems like we can do better. And I think what we've seen from regulated cannabis does vindicate that to an extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about this? You know, there's, um, there are people that are in need of something, not uh, psilocybin or or otherwise, Um, you know, we're coming out of COVID, um, there is a nonprofit called Theracell who is uh, asking our health minister, Patty Haidu, for that, um, for that exemption uh, for psilocybin treatment for end of life, um, AKA palliative care patients. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about that. Like, um, is is that the right avenue to pursue um in your opinion um uh or is there another way to do it um and and how do we keep the focus on patients yeah no uh, great questions i so as you pointed out it's possible to get an exemption under the controlled drugs and substances act Uh, to be exempt from any of its provisions. And this is typically used for people doing research with controlled substances. They can get a, they can apply to the minister and and get an exemption allowing them to possess. Uh, In my experience, the minister will not authorize uh, production of of psychedelics. I think section 56 exemptions 
were used on a case-by-case basis prior to the MMAR, so prior to 2001, to give medical access to cannabis. I've met one individual who accessed it that way in the 90s legally, um, but those were case-by-case, which is very cumbersome and uh, inconsistent. So it's there's nothing... The, the, there's nothing preventing the minister from issuing those authorizations. Uh, my understanding is that none of them have been approved. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a judicial review application uh, being led by a lawyer called Paul Lewin and a lawyer called Matthew Jackson. Um, Paul's in Toronto and Matthew's in uh, British Columbia. Um, and they're, they're doing two things. And, and I'm very, fortunate and very grateful to be part of a team working with them. Um, My expertise is relevant uh, because part of, part of the whole, you you know, the, the arguments being made have to recognize that the current system, which I know a lot about uh, the prescription drug system just isn't enough that, that maybe uh, a broader access makes sense for these compounds. Some of these compounds much like it does with, cannabis and and much like was the case in the late 1990s with cannabis when a man was arrested for cultivating his own cannabis uh, because he used it to treat his epilepsy available drugs did not treat his epilepsy correctly and he needed cannabis to do that and since there was no way to access it the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, was of the view that cannabis uh, could not be a controlled substance uh, unless there was a way to access it medically. And that finding led to the MMAR being put in place in 2001, which, uh, uh, which was the first system people could access cannabis under. It's not impossible that, that efforts to, to allow people access to psilocybin could result in a similar program. Uh, there are prescription drugs that are uh, going through regulatory approval that include psilocybin. Um, and, but there's a difference between medical access, which is how cannabis is still sold under Part 14 of the cannabis regulations and was sold since 2001 and in its current form, let's say, since 2013. Uh, those, that system, that kind of system is different than prescription drugs. And it's a lot more self-directed and i think that kind of system could work uh certainly for psilocybin and and maybe for other psychedelics and and part of what uh paul and his team are doing is is launching a constitutional challenge uh which would would apply to the constitution more broadly in addition to a judicial review application of the specific cases that Health Canada denied Section 56 applications on. So, I mean, I I can't comment too much on on something like this that's ongoing, but but just as a legal position, it's it's very interesting to think uh, we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, and Section 7 of the Charter uh, gives us the right to uh, security the person and to, to be healthy basically would be a way to say it in lay terms. And that's the section of the charter that, that kind of says total prohibition of a medically useful substance isn't good enough. That That's too much of an infringement of charter rights. It makes sense to accommodate the charter rights by giving some level of access. So with the MMAR and the MMPR and the ACMPR, that meant, exempting people from criminal prohibition of possession, as long as their doctor's on board and their doctor fills out the paperwork, then then these special companies get to grow cannabis and sell it to these people. Um, or well, one company in the first system, but then multi-participants starting in 2013. So d- depending on how things work out with psilocybin, it's, it is not impossible that a similar system gets put in place. And, and that's really up to, you know, the courts and everything that happens from here forward. But a lot of the arguments are analogous. I mean, you have an, an organism, it's not a plant, it's a fungus, but you have an organism that has a very strong 
psychoactive chemical in it. It's regulated as a controlled substance, uh, and by that I mean prohibited. However, it's non-lethal, and, and there seems to be a large number of benefits, um, and that's based on science. That's not just based on hand-waving, and there seems to be a large number of people using these substances uh, without ruining their lives. So it might make sense to not use law enforcement uh, to shut down people that are using something that's helping them medically. You know, and it's, it's again, it's, it's a little off the narrative of our evidence-based system for pharmaceutical regulatory approval, but, you know, there are, cannabis was Canada's first experiment with this, and, and it was a long experiment. It, I mean, we had 17 years of regulated medical cannabis before we had regulation of adult use cannabis. So I, I think there's something to be said for at least considering a similar approach with psilocybin. And it looks like this constitutional challenge will be the venue that happens in. And do you, um, do you foresee a, an easier pathway, not only because uh, cannabis has already forged a bit of a legalization path, but because maybe it's part of the part of the difficulty with cannabis is that you really can't assign a single drug uh, identification number to it, as far as as I understand. But maybe it's easier to do so with certain psychedelic substances. How do you how do you see that uh, playing out? Oh well, there will be pharmaceutical drugs with DINs, drug identification numbers, which means it's approved for sale at a particular dosage for a particular condition in a particular dosage form. And and th there just will be. I mean, uh, MAPS Public Benefit Corporation is uh, working on, is in phase three of clinical trials with MDMA. Um, to paraphrase, I believe a recent report they released said something around two thirds of, of patients who had gone through the therapy were free of PTSD six months later, which is well ahead of index on the next best comparative therapy. Uh, and let, again, worth pointing out, involved using MDMA, I believe on two occasions only, right, compared to daily use of, of drugs with side effects. Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, you know, knock on wood, never say never, or never, never say for sure, but very much on track to be a prescription drug soon, MDMA. But as you very astutely pointed out, cannabis, cannabis is, is truly a substance, right? THC is a drug. Cannabis is a substance. You know, it, it all, it it's smells like different. 300 uh, or more different uh, uh, drugs in one. It's, a, it's, a, it's yeah. an entire pharmacy, if you will. Well, drug, 300 different drugs if a Glade air freshener is a drug because there's the strongly psychoactive phytocannabinoids right? Well, one that's strongly psychoactive and others that I don't think we really understand. And then, and then you have terpenoids that are going to direct the whole thing. And then flavonoids and isopropanoids and other chemicals that are going to also steer that experience. But with, and, and I think, well, not, I think it's teams tried at this point to, to say that we, the same thing is going on with uh, psilocybin mushrooms. There's baocystin and, uh, and, and ratios of psilocin to psilocybin in them, but all of that makes a difference. It has to. So we just don't get it yet. And, and I'm, I'm, well, right now you can go read different, uh, uh, basically some published material, a lot of conjecture on, on what these different molecules do. And, you know, I mean, you're gonna see advances monthly, if not weekly in that going forward. But to come back to your question, yes, it's going to be easier and it is easier because you can have an effective therapy with just MDMA. You can have an effective therapy with just psilocybin, with just LSD, with just dimethyltryptamine, ibogaine. And, and the, I kind of named the most common five there, I think. Uh, and, and let's not forget ketamine. Uh, out of all those, the only one that's purely synthetic, um, LSD, and is and not one of one of the only ones that really does have a drug identification number. It is the only one. If you're gonna if you're gonna pile disassociative anesthetics in with uh, uh, with psychedelics, then 
yeah, ketamine's in, and it's one of them. And uh, it's it's being used effectively to treat depression. You know, it just is. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and I think it's also interesting how, well, we'll, we'll come back to ketamine in a second, because just with psychedelics, it's going to be easier to get bins than it was with cannabis because you're talking about one molecule, ignoring the entourage effect of psilocybin. You're talking about single molecule therapies, at least for now. I mean, I'm sure as thinking evolves on this, as restrictions loosen up, I mean, I've heard of plenty of, uh, let's say underground uh, people helping others by giving them combinations of MDMA and psilocybin or combinations of MDMA and uh, ketamine, or combinations of MDMA and LSD. Uh, so that's version one. I think we'll see, again, as more research develops, you know, more mixing of these things to get to particular goals, just as people better understand what they're aiming at, right? But uh, I think for now, single molecule therapies are, are going to be the first things to get DINs, Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then we'll see what happens with off label use, but, uh, it, it will be easier because it's easier to define the thing you're studying. It's easier to do a control with where I, and, and it has been done with cannabis. I mean, it's not available in Canada, but Epidiolex is essentially a 100 milligram per mil CBD tincture. That's not pure CBD. It's a plant extract and it has regulatory approval in some countries. So it's, it you can do it with cannabis i think it's just it gets complicated when you're looking at plant medicines and actually a a group uh if i'm it's okay to bring them up node uh is spelled k-n-o-w-d-e uh advisory group is a clinical research organization i work with that uh but that's exactly what they're specializing in is how to design clinical trials a for plant medicines generally and B for psychedelics specifically, because the two do overlap a bit and there's special considerations on how you design controls uh, in, in the study for plant medicines. And then there's special considerations on how you're going to accommodate, you know, the experiences people are having and, and what they're going through during a study in terms of psychedelics. So that's one example of an organization that's focused on, on helping people with that problem. And by people and problem, I mean, helping companies that want to, get bins on let's say broad spectrum plant products or, or get natural product numbers for for non-cannabis applications that can be sold as natural health products you know helping design studies for that so yes it's it's going to be easier to get a din uh because these are compounds that can be used in single molecule it's going to be complicated to get a din because of uh, justifiable caution by the regulator on, on products that are profoundly psychoactive. And, but I think that's more addressable by how studies are being designed, who's involved, how credible it is. Uh, I think that will be relatively easy to get past, provided the studies are being designed responsibly and with people involved who are known quantities to the regulators. Um, You've talked about a few of the things that you're involved with. Can we talk about uh, one of the companies who's been in the news uh, as of today? Yeah. Um, I know you're on the board of advisors for Sancero. Let's talk about Sancero for a second. Um, yeah, no, so they're great company. <laughs> developing, uh, and we've just been talking about psilocybin. So, um, you know, they're they're developing uh, psilocybin um, uh, uh products or, uh, you know, particular formulations. So, um, yeah, tell me a little bit about, you know, um, your, you know, why it's important for you to get involved with um, companies like Sancero. I'll also bring up SciGen, uh, an amazing company that um, uh, we can get into second. Um, but, you know, how are you involved and why is this important? So, I mean, uh, with, with Sancero, uh, I'm, uh, I mean, it was first brought up to me by uh, Daryl Hudson, uh, a, a friend and, and client and colleague, someone, someone I have a ton of respect for, uh, in, in actually late 2018. And then we, uh, 
he kind of developed his plan, got his uh, partner in life and in business, Irie Selkirk, involved, and they hired a, a guy called Steve Sadoff as their CEO. And Steve has a ton of experience in regulated products, um, I believe alcohol, uh, natural health products, and pharmaceuticals. So, you know, great person to have uh, in the CEO role. And, you know, that, that company kind of came together in the summer of 2019. Um, and they are doing, they, they have a very focused and credible approach to developing a formulation. Um, and uh, obviously can't get into too many of the details, but it's why I think, uh, and I am a patent agent, uh, that they have a, 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 a good approach to this from an IP perspective is that their, their therapeutic products are not just psilocybin they're psilocybin plus other chemicals and those other chemicals are uh, all or at least for the most part all the ones i'm aware of are generally regarded as safe or grass that's a known acronym which means they're they're th they're chemicals that that while there may not be a ton of safety data on they're kind of herbs that have been used forever you know we don't know for how long like right? things things you just this is not one of the ingredients, but it was pointed out to me once that Saskatoon berries were not approved for sale in the United Kingdom. I've never fact checked this, might not be real, but uh, someone told me once that they, they just had no evidence that they were safe, you know, but there, there are, uh, and, and they weren't native to Europe, so they didn't, you know, there's some issue there, uh, apparently. But uh, I, I only bring that uh, hearsay up to, to illustrate the point that when you have a substance that's generally regarded as safe, if you can prove that it's good for something, then you've kind of already passed the safety data part and, and you can, you know, put it on the market, providing your manufacturing and compliance and in compliance generally for natural health products. What Sancero is doing is they're taking compounds from other plants and fungi and mixing them with psilocybin and, and they're, they're seeing differences between just psilocybin or just the other ingredients or the combination. And, uh, and they've got a very effective way of testing this. And it's, uh, um, it's, just, it, it's a very credible uh, approach that I have a lot of confidence in. And they're, uh, that what they announced with Canada Global, I, I think just brings a lot more, um, you know, horsepower to, to what they're doing. Because I mean, having Lauren Gertner involved is, is just gonna obviously open a lot of doors. And uh, I mean, I've met him. Uh, uh, he bought me dinner once in Berlin, one of the uh, better nights of that conference. Thank you very much, Lauren. Really enjoyed yeah. that night. And uh, Lauren, Lauren you know, Gertner, just, just for, for people that are watching that don't know um, Lauren, he uh, it was the, uh, bra um, the brains behind uh, Tokyo Smoke as well as other brands. Well, I'm, I'm sure his son, Alan, contributed a lot, too. He ran the company. I mean, let's not diminish him. But but yes, uh, I'm sure Lauren contributed enormously to their success. Um, but it, uh, it it's it just it's a great validation for that company. because I've been with them since the start. I'm a founding member. And it's wonderful to see this opportunity coming together um, for them. And uh, my, my partner, Mike Salikin, and I, have both been working with them since since very early in this whole process. So it's uh, it's been great to to watch that come together and see it get to where it is now and and you know where I, I believe it to be going, which I cannot discuss. But it's uh, it, it's it's wonderful to be part of, uh, to say the least. And it, it's great. Like it used to be a bigger trend in cannabis. It's a diminishing trend, although it's still very strong it's wonderful to work with people who really, really believe in what they're doing. They don't see it as only an economic opportunity. They see it as that, but not only that. And that's, it's just wonderful. I mean, if you're going to work at the pace that's required to remain relevant in, in psychedelics, it's, it's, it helps to enjoy what you're doing. So, okay, final question. We don't have any questions from the audience, but my final question will be, um, more of a forecast, five to 10 years, where will you be and where will psychedelics be in Canada specifically? Uh, I have no idea where I'll be. I've learned it's, uh, it's very difficult to predict where things go. I mean, I'm, I'm quite happy with, with what's going on around me now, but you know, things, things change so quickly. So, I mean, I know I'll be working in psychedelics. 
I, uh, for now, it looks like private practice law is the place to do that. And, uh, but you know, you're always, and, and I don't want to give the wrong impression. I'm very happy doing that, but it's, yeah, I don't know where things are going. And I'm, I'm very happy that I have my science background. Um, it just increases my relevance in, in a lot of ways when I'm working with these clients. So me personally, I don't know. I'll be working in psychedelics and cannabis uh, exactly where and what capacity. Uh, uh, that I really don't know, but uh, which is exciting. I consider that a plus, not a negative. And well, it's always nice to have a PhD to fall, that, fall back on, right? <laughs> yes. But uh, that's easier to say when you don't have one. <laughs> but uh, yes, of course, it's definitely an asset. Um, but I, uh, I also, I think where psychedelics will be, where I hope they'll be, is in five to 10 years, I hope we're seeing the start of, of something outside of, certainly outside of pharmaceutical only access, and hopefully outside of, you know, a solution to correct to define medical problem. I really, really believe that, that to be the best we can, you know, subject to screening, subject to mental illness, you know, there are certain people that definitely should not take them. But uh, uh, I, I just think we can do better than prohibiting them. And I still think we can do better than by allowing them only as a solution to a problem when people are sick. That's a personal opinion. You know, it's, uh, um, I, I'm sure I'll meet people who feel very differently. But I, I really think that the best way to do this would involve uh, something along the lines of what we're seeing in Jamaica, you know, where we have people responsibly operating retreats where, where that can happen. Like it, it, to me, it can be done. And I don't know if five or 10 years is a realistic time frame. I, I think it could be 10 years, certainly five years, maybe, but I, I think, I think it would make sense if, if there were a way to do that in this country. And, uh, and I, I you know, we'll, I think it's going to be a very uh, interesting few years here. I mean, just once MDMA is approved for PTSD, it may get used for off-label. And then once we see the potential, and by off-label, I mean to correct other problems uh, other than what it's approved for. Well, like S-ketamine is approved for depression. That's my understanding anyway. But, but regular old racemic ketamine, that's the left and right-handed molecules, I believe is just approved to be an anesthetic, but can be used to treat depression off label. I think we'll see that happen with psilocybin and with MDMA, which will probably be the first two drug products. So once that happens, and then the potential applications start to expand in a legitimate, completely above board way, I think you open the door to allowing access to these things for personal development and for, uh, you know, people just to be the best version of themselves. Ah, personal development. That's going to be a big topic. I know it will be in the coming years, but uh, it will it will hinge on just kind of nailing down some of the like medical benefits, the 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 very definitive medical benefits of of some of these substances. So. Um, David Wood, it's been amazing talking to you. Um, and this hour has gone by and we haven't even touched on a couple of the things that I wanted to ask you. I really hope you come back for a second conversation. Oh, happy to. You know where to find me. I do have other shirts like this. I can wear a different one next time. <laughs> I, I was going to say, is that is that one of the John Lennon? Uh... <laughs> yes, it is, is it? actually. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the, the nice one. <laughs> Covered in flowers too, you know, cannabis <laughs> flowers. Why not other flowers? But yeah, no, I, uh, I, I, I like what what networking in this industry has done to my business casual. It's uh, a, another another perk. <laughs> well, you're 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 such a, a connected and 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 very thoughtful person in this space, and I really hope that you come back for another discussion. Yeah, likewise. I uh, hope you enjoy the summer. Take care. My goodness, of course. So uh, I'll just close this off by saying thank you so much for everyone that uh, that joined us today. We will, uh, I hope, uh, continue this conversation uh, very soon uh, again with David Wood. But until then, we'll be talking. We'll be talking to other psychedelics insiders. Thank you once again, David Wood. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a pleasure, and uh, I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you. Thanks for joining the Psychedelic Insider Series. 
brought to you by Microdose and the Conscious Fund. Visit our website at www.microdose.buzz.